Warm welcome everyone. My name is Anita Yori and I'm a co-curator of the festival programs, discourse program of CTM. And I'm also a research associate at Berlin University of the Arts and I will host this whole afternoon today. Um, Warm well, welcome once again to this uh, research networking day. Uh, it's traditionally, let's say, the first day of uh, the discourse program of CTM. And um, we invited different researchers, students um, from different fields to present their ideas about the festival topic, Liminal. And um, it's an international platform, a research networking day uh, for exchange. So as the name says, it's a networking day. So I really encourage everyone in the room to talk to each other and discuss also in the, within the breaks, let's say, those different topics um, we are discussing here also today. And um, Beside, yeah, the presenters today here, the students, there are a lot of other students in the room, as far as I know. Students, for example, from Berlin University of the Arts, from Humboldt University, and also from the University of Hildesheim. So, warm welcome here also in the room. And please always be encouraged to be part of the discussions we are having here today and ask questions and so on. So, I. And the last presenter of this uh, module is Steve uh, Garfano. So Steve, the stage is yours. Uh, Steve is from Humboldt University of Berlin and is a musician and a neuroscience researcher based in Berlin and New Orleans. He's concluding a master's degree in cognitive neuroscience at the Berlin School of Mind and Brain at Humboldt University, where his research investigates the brain's mechanisms for the perception and production of musical rhythm. A professional drummer, Steve has experienced the power of rhythm to connect humans across cultural and geographic lines. And his presentation title is Entertainment in the Space Between Perception and Action. Hello. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Uh, how do you make this thing big in German? What's the word for bigify? <laughs> Sorry, it's in German. So yeah. I need all the help from my German friends that I can get. Yeah, yeah. Yes. right on, right on. Uh, greetings, yes, my name is Steve, and um, I have the good fortune of um, uh, working with the team at uh, Cherite, uh, yes, yes, under yes, the yes, guidance yes. of Dr. Gabriel Curio and Dr. Gunnar Waterstrat. Uh, and we've been doing some research into neural entrainment, um, which is, uh, a mechanism through which the brain is able to track uh, rhythm through time. In the, in the case of our work, musical rhythm. And uh, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about this. Um, I myself uh, have been a musician much longer than I have been in the brain business. Um, and uh, in particular, my my work uh, as a drummer has dealt with uh, being a live drummer in electronic situations, uh, dealing with loops and samples and things like this. So a lot of uh, what I've done as a musician has has dealt with issues of synchronicity, you know, between a human uh, and a machine. So uh, this work uh, has been full of interesting insight for me. Let's see, maybe you will find it similarly. Interesting. Uh, this dude, Christian Huygens, I don't know how to say his name, I don't, my Dutch is as bad as my German, uh, was one of the first observers of this phenomenon that we call entrainment, um, which uh, is a process by which two oscillating systems uh, come into a synchronicity. Um, this fellow, Christian, uh, was, was bedridden with an illness and he was uh, producing pendulum-driven clocks. And there were two of these clocks across the bedroom from him. And he noticed that these clocks would, uh, would synchronize over time. Uh, and even if they were perturbed, if one of them was, was bumped uh, so that they swung out of synchronization, they would eventually re-synchronize out of phase. And he, he puzzled over this while being, uh, while being ill and um, so he was the first describer of this phenomenon, and, and basically what we're talking about are, are, are these two or more uh, independent systems oscillating and uh, achieving a synchronicity because of the interaction of, uh, of forces between them. 
Um, so this is something that we see in a lot of natural systems. Um, most relevant for me, given that I am jet lagged and also a nocturnal person, is that our bodies synchronize our circadian rhythms, our, our patterns of sleep and wake are uh, entrained to the solar cycle. So when the sun is up, we're wakeful. When the sun goes down, we get sleepy. As the hours of daylight shift through the seasons, our, uh, our wake and sleep cycles shift accordingly. We are entrained to the solar cycle. Uh, but this is also something that we can, we can talk about on a variety of, uh, in a variety of disciplines um, in, um, uh, in psychology, let's say. Um, if we are having a conversation, we are to some degree entrained to one another. We're paying attention to the timing of what I'm saying and when will you speak, when will I speak. Uh, in order for us to communicate, we have to have some sort of synchronicity. Um, and in the case of, of music, we see entrainment, this kind of synchronicity on a lot of levels in the sense that uh, if we go to the Philharmonic, obviously the conductor is creating a, a pulse for the orchestra to follow. The audience is listening to the orchestra. They are uh, entrained to the music that they're hearing. Dancers are entrained to the band. Uh, so, uh, to me, it's a, it's a fascinating thing to consider that when we're all at the club or uh, in the concert hall, uh, we're not only synchronized to the music, but in being synchronized to that pulse, we're also synchronized to each other. Um, but uh, let's move forward. Let's talk about brains. Uh, brains are made of neurons. And um, the concept that I just want to introduce right here is that um, in this single neuron, um, at, at this end, we have dendrites, which are receiving signal from their neighbors, and that signal is traveling down the length of the axon uh, to downstream neighbors. Uh, and this is an electrical impulse, and uh, that's a signal that we can measure at the scalp using a technique we call EEG, uh, which uh, involves a, a net of electrodes worn on the head, uh, these electrodes uh, detect voltage changes as the cells in the brain are firing. They're producing these uh, uh, electrical fields. Um, and so EEG uh, measures this in, in real time with high temporal resolution. Um, it produces uh, data that looks a bit like this if we choose to, uh, to visualize it. Um, <coughs> the, my first encounter with uh, with EEG in the lab, uh, I thought it looked like digital audio. Uh, personally, it looks like multi-track um, linear uh, waveforms to me. Uh, and interestingly, uh, when you are working with this kind of data, you're using techniques that are very familiar to, uh, to people who work with digital audio. You're using shelving filters and bandpass filters. And we're trying to uh, pull a signal out of noise which is something that's familiar to anybody who has worked with a distorted guitar, for example. Um, so, but each, each one of these lanes is, uh, represents one electrode and the signal uh, that it's picking up as we move uh, left to right through time. Uh, so when we talk about rhythm, we can talk about it in a number of ways. We can represent it uh, in kind of traditional musical notation, uh, the top lane there. Um, this is kind of your four on the floor, boom chick, boom chick, that's familiar to everybody in Berlin. Uh, you've got four bass drum notes on the quarter note. Uh, there's a hi-hat note on the offbeat. And then let's say that there's a cymbal crash uh, on the, the downbeat of each bar. Um, so if we were to represent that as digital audio, this is the, the waveform that you would be familiar with in Pro Tools or Ableton. Um, but if we consider that you are listening to this rhythm as it passes by, there is going to be corresponding electrical activity in your brain, um, which would be reflected in this EEG time series if we were recording from your head if, uh, while you were listening. And um, so the concept here is that um, if we had good data and good techniques, we could extract from this EEG signal 
uh, oscillations uh, reflecting your, your brain's activity, and we would find oscillations that correspond to the rhythm that you're listening to. So in this case, we have this quarter note at 120 beats per minute, which if we express as a frequency, that's two cycles per second, that's two hertz. Uh, so we would find this oscillatory waveform at two hertz, the beat, the beat frequency right here. Um, we would also find a component that corresponds to the meter frequency. So if we have this event that happens on the one every time, um, that's a pattern that's happening at a frequency of uh, 0.5 hertz. So we would also see this oscillatory component. Um, and to, when I learned that, I thought that was fascinating. Uh, in, uh, in our work, um, we were dealing with polyrhythm, which is a complex form of rhythm wherein you have sort of these non-factorial rhythmic groupings. You have three over two. Um, there are polyrhythms that are other organizations, but in this case, three, three over two is about as simple as you get, and you have three notes happening in the span of two notes. So that's something that doesn't resolve if you, if you were to program it in MIDI on a duple grid, you would see that those three don't fit squarely into the grid based in two. So the question is, how does the brain track these two independent rhythms? Um, that's something that we pursued. And, and so you can think of a polyrhythm as uh, Rubin's vase, something we call a bistable percept, suggesting that are you seeing a vase or are you seeing a face? You could see either one, and it may, it may alternate for you depending on uh, your perception, um, a polyrhythm is a, sim a similar bistable percept. Do you hear the three as the bass with the two as a variant against it, or do you hear the two as the bass and the three as the variant? So, <coughs> so our questions were about how does the brain track polyrhythm? Um, and <coughs> regarding entrainment, the idea is that the, the brain, in listening to a repeating uh, rhythm, synchronizes um, to that rhythm so that you're, there's, there's neural activity at the frequency of the rhythm that you're listening to. That, that four on the floor at 120 beats per minute corresponds to a neural oscillation of two hertz. Um, and could we distinguish this uh, locked oscillation from uh, an auditory evoked potential, which is just your brain's reaction to the sound? You hear the sound and the process of, of um, perceiving that sound creates an electrical signal, and could we distinguish those? Uh, could we distinguish the sync from the reaction, let's say? Uh, and then what were the relationships between training, uh, the strength of that, of that entrainment and musical performance? We thought that there would be uh, a positive relationship between musical training, uh, entrainment strength, and musical accuracy. And, um, this, uh, you're gonna have to forgive me, I'm gonna skip some slides. I know that that's poor form, but I put way more stuff in here than, than any of us really wanna hear about. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna jump through this. Um, and uh, it takes us back here, which is, I'm just gonna reinforce this idea that, that a repetitious rhythm is creating repetitious brain activity, let's say. Uh, so the paradigm that we developed um, was to have a stick figure come in uh, we had uh, uh, we had uh, friends and colleagues come in and, and be our subjects, uh, people ranging from no musical experience to a, a percussionist with the Komisha Opera. And um, so people uh, were wearing headphones and an EEG net. Uh, they had an electronic drum. Wait a minute, I got a picture of this somewhere. That, okay, that's, that's what it looks like, right? Um, so uh, you would hear three bars of a polyrhythm, um, and then there would be one bar of silence, then there would be a cue. One or the other rhythm would be played. The, the two components of the polyrhythm were sounded by different instruments, a wood block and a snare drum. I'll play it for you in a second. Um, the idea behind the bar of silence is that it would give us a period in which we could evaluate the, the EEG data in the absence of stimulus. And if we saw these oscillations continuing in the absence of stimulus, we knew that this was entrainment. This was the brain synchronizing to the rhythm that, that subjects were attending to. Um, and then once they were cued whether to uh, play the triple rhythm or the duple rhythm, they hit the drum 
um, and we recorded their responses and uh, were able to, to compare this to, uh, to their musical training and, and to their EEG data. Um, we used Ableton Live to program and, to, and capture some of this data, which was uh, interesting to me to be able to take my digital audio gear and do brain science with it. Um, so let's see if I can play you what this thing sounded like. The ghost of Steve Jobs is not cooperating with my, with my multimedia operation here. Let's see if this... Hmm. Let's uh, do it like this. So this is this polyrhythmic stimulus. And uh, people had to listen to this 150 times. They were very gracious to tolerate it. And uh, that's the cue. And following that cue, subjects would have to hit the drum. Uh, if it was a woodblock sound, of silence, Q. Uh, so depending on the sound, you hear the woodblock, you hear the snare drum, you're cued to respond in that rhythm. Um, and uh, what's interesting about that sound, it's as, it's as simple as a polyrhythm could be. Um, but in listening to it, you could hear either the snare drum as the, as the, the pulse, uh, or you could hear the woodblock as the pulse, and different people hear it different ways. Sometimes you start hearing it one way and then it switches. Um, and for those of us who had to listen to it over and over, um, it became really deeply ingrained. Um, <clears throat> what we found was that uh, musical training correlated positively with, uh, with musical accuracy, which you might expect. Um, we found that uh, increased oscillatory power at the frequency of the rhythms um, uh, correlated with, with accuracy. Um, and, uh, and this increase in oscillatory power is, is kind of our measure of entrainment. Is the brain tracking this rhythm? Is it, uh, is it synchronized, shall we say? Um, and we did see these, uh, these oscillations continuing through the silent period, uh, which tells us that's entrainment. Um, and, uh, and we found um, oscillatory power at 3.5 hertz, which, uh, so the, the duple rhythm, the snare drum, uh, was happening at a frequency of 1.166 hertz, the triple at a frequency of 175. Um, so the, the blue star is in the, the frequency spectra of the, the EEG data that we, that we recorded. Uh, there's this peak at the, uh, at the duple rhythm frequency. Uh, interestingly, we didn't find a peak at the triple rhythm frequency, but we did find this tall peak uh, at the first common harmonic of the two rhythm frequencies, which means basically that your brain's trying to track these two independent rhythms that don't resolve easily, um, but doing that in a sort of an integrated manner um, at the, at the multiples of those two frequencies, if that makes sense. Uh, and so what we found is that, um, is that the more trained you are as a musician, the stronger that oscillatory power, that entrainment at that common frequency. Um, we also, uh, through the algorithmic wizardry of Dr. Gunnar Watterstrat, uh, we were able to um, see this correlation between uh, accuracy and uh, entrainment, um, and, and so you see here, uh, this is when the stimulus is being played, this is the silence period, and we see this oscillation continue through the silence, uh, which reinforces this idea that we're seeing uh, an entrained oscillation. Um, so what does it all mean? Um, it's interesting to me that we are uh, sort of wired to synchronize. Um, and I, I think the, it's interesting, you know, everybody's talking about uh, club culture and, and music culture, you know, uh, there's obviously something very visceral and deep in our wiring that leads us to repetitious rhythm and it leads us to experiencing it 
in a communal way. Um, you know, we could all dance at home by ourselves, and certainly I do on occasion, but it's way more fun to be in a, in a room full of people, everybody listening to the same tempo, everybody listening to the same beat. And so there are these ideas about uh, what does all of this mean uh, in our brains? And um, to me, uh, well, I put this up, so I'm just going to... I'm just going to say some words about it. Basically, there is an idea that our uh, our perceptual systems, our our brains, um, are operating at an uh, in an oscillatory fashion. And uh, as we as we perceive stimuli coming to us, either auditorily, visually, um, our brains are trying to lock to that to that frequency so that our perceptual um, accuracy is increased. And so there are several theories about this. There's also this idea, uh, the predictive coding hypothesis, which I'm totally not going to explain sufficiently, but just go with me. Um, the thing that I take away from it is that our brains are sort of uh, built to predict. We create a model of our environment, um, and we use that model to predict what is going to happen in the future. And uh, if our predictions don't match what we're experiencing, then there's an error term, and our brain wants to minimize that error term. And, so what it says to me is that we, we, are, we like to predict, and musical rhythm is to some degree, or, or to be locked to musical rhythm is to some degree to predict when the next beat is going to happen. You're not reacting to every beat when you're dancing. You know that that beat is coming, and your, your movement is prepared, and you are, um, you are locked to that, uh, to that rhythm. And, and so to me, I think part of our fascination with... Um, with participating in rhythm has to do with the communion kind of between between people. We're all sharing the same synchronicity, um, but it's also that our brains like to predict and we like to be right. And so every time we're there with the beat, it's gratifying to us. And I have nothing empirical to back that up, but I got the microphone, so you got to listen to what I'm saying. Uh, I'm going to this is something that's super fascinating to me. I'm just going to drop this in at the end. Uh, there's this researcher, Neil P.M. Todd, um, who has this, uh, what he calls the vestibular theory of rhythm. And um, in 1999, 2000, he was at the University of Manchester and uh, went to clubs uh, in the neighborhood and took measurements about uh, frequency, spectra, and sound pressure levels uh, in the clubs. Um, he went back to the laboratory, he took a kick drum from a techno record, and he brought people into his laboratory, and he played this sound um, at really high volume uh, in their ears from like 90 decibels to 125, something like this. And uh, so while, while these people are, are getting this kick drum in their ear, he's also measuring the electrical activity in the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is like from your, beneath your ear to your collarbone. And uh, what he found was that at high sound pressure levels, there is activity in this muscle. And I, I think about this every time I am standing next to a giant speaker and my head is nodding. And, you know, you think about this muscle as a, as a resonant body. It's under tension, sort of like a guitar string maybe, you know. And so there is <coughs> vibration being transduced from this giant speaker uh, to our muscles, to our bones, our, our lungs, our resonant cavities. Um, and so <clears throat> we're picking up a lot of information bodily. We experience it as sound, but it's something that is being detected um, through all of these other different sensory modalities, including your vibrotactile senses, which is a sexy science word, vibrotactile. Uh, but anyway, so this, this theory is basically saying that, so uh, adjacent to the inner ear are these three uh, semicircular canals which uh, tell us about the orientation of our body. Are we moving forward? Are we stationary? Are we, is my head tilted? Uh, it's like the gyroscopes in your iPhone. Um, and so <clears throat> the concept here in this, in this theory is that, um, that part of our experience of musical rhythm uh, is a bodily, it is an experience of bodily motion that um, because the semicircular canals are adjacent to the eardrum, it's possible that vibrations are being transduced <coughs> from the eardrum to the uh, vestibular organs, which would manifest as an experience of forward motion, of, of bodily motion. Um, 
And uh, so Professor Todd posits that, you know, we like, to, um, we like to sit in a rocking chair, we like to swing on a swing, we like repetitious cyclical bodily motion. And um, so rhythm is a, is a component of that. And certainly when we're dancing, which uh, Dr. Todd calls uh, vestibular self-stimulation, which is another super sexy science word for dancing. Um, I just, I think that this is fascinating. And as a drummer, it is resonant, it's a resonant idea for me that, that what, we, uh, what we think of as an auditory experience actually sort of feels like motion, even if we're not dancing. And um, so I'll leave you with that. Oh, wait, no, I'm not. I'm gonna leave you with this. Here's my last bit of fascinating idea. Um, so the, the stimulus that I played for you, this three over two polyrhythm. Oh, let's see if I can get this thing up. Right. Um, if you take that rhythm and you speed it up, that three over two, um, if you speed it up, this is what happens. Let's just give it a whirl here. Idea. Basically, the point here is that you can take a rhythm, and if you speed it up, there's a point at which it ceases to be a rhythm and it becomes a tone. In this case, the three over two polyrhythm uh, becomes a perfect fifth, the, the musical interval. Uh, so the, I don't know, this just freaks me out. Uh, <laughs> The, the fact that, you know, um, there's just, there's some kind of point, maybe we can, this is something we'll address in the laboratory someday, but um, basically just consider that, uh, you know, your experience of, of a pitch of, a, of an interval or a rhythm is really sort of subjective based on the way that our uh, perceptual systems handle the speed of these, of these waveforms and, um, so that's fascinating. Maybe you agree, maybe not. Um, maybe there's another slide, but maybe not. Let's no, yeah, that's it. Okay, <laughs> we're done. Uh, here are some references. Let's look at that. And uh, yeah, Thank you. that's what I got for you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Steve. Any questions from Thank the you. audience? Yeah, there is two, two questions. Uh, thank you for your stunning talk um, for the presentation. Um, I'm interested in uh, listening to white noise uh, f uh, for concentrating or as a sleeping aid. Mm. And I was wondering if there is any entrainment observable in this auditory stimulus. Mm, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm inclined to think that, um, well, certainly there is some sort of brain activity corresponding to, to what you're hearing, whether um, whether that manifests in, uh, like on, on what scale that is rhythmic. Um, I couldn't exactly say, given that white noise is like broadband and, and across the frequency spectrum. Um, you, this is an interesting question. Oh, sorry. Um, and one that I, I could bullshit you, but that would just be dishonest. Um, if, uh, you know, actually, I, when we're done, come see me and we, could, we can talk. But, um, you know, it's interesting that there are a lot of, um, you know, products and techniques that are, that are popular um, where people are trying to um, kind of 
take advantage of these psychoacoustic phenomena, the binaural beats. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's a similar sort of thing. And, um, and I think that this phenomenon of entrainment has um, potential for therapeutic purpose um, in the sense that we, you know, you're able to induce particular oscillatory activity by using musical uh, frequencies, either, either pitch or, or rhythm, uh, and possibly this kind of broadband um, white noise like you're talking about. Um, so that's something that I hope that we get the chance to dig into in the future. Two more questions on the left. Hi. Hi. So you mentioned if an audience is listening to music or sound or rhythm, they're getting entrained. In the case of a live performer or DJ or somebody else who's producing that output or controlling that output, and they're getting entrained to the entrainment of the people responding. So it's kind of like meta entrainment or something. For sure. Do you have any uh, sort of science to talk about the meta entrainment, of, especially as a performer, you, you learning from the audience's response? Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting point to make that it's sort of, uh, <coughs> that it becomes like a, a feedback loop that, uh, that I entrain to you, you entrain to me, and that we have a sort of bi-directional communication. Um, and definitions of entrainment vary. If you're talking about perceptual, perceptual neuroscience, uh, entrainment is sort of a one-way thing from a stimulus to my brain entrains to a stimulus. But in the case of, uh, if we talk about um, entrainment in a musicological sense, um, that sort of bi-directional phenomenon is really important, and I, I think it's a um, kind of characteristic of the way that humans interact. You know that we um, that that we seek to to align. You know, and that is like a uh, an accommodation on on the, on the part of both parties. You know, and I, and I think music is a super cool example of that. That. Um, you know, certainly a, a DJ can read a crowd and, um, you know, the, the dancing and the, um, you know, I think of like a, <clears throat> like a ballroom in the big band era, you know, when you had 15 musicians on stage and someone conducting and a whole room full of people dancing, the, um, the number of levels of, of kind of synchronicity are, are, are nested really. I was uh, really densely. I was told that in some traditions, and like uh, musical traditions, this idea of the audience responding is just as important as the musician performing. But obviously, I, I don't have a reference point at, or or any kind of scientific way to back that up. But I was told that that's a a thing. That yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I think uh, like in our academic study of of music performance, it's important to remember that um, so much uh, music research has happened in a very narrow span of the human phenomenon of music, that it's, you know, Western uh, tonal concert music of the late 20th century, you know, is kind of what we talk about. But over the span of human history, so much music has been made not by professionals performing for an audience, but like, you know, the guy who lives next door and you are around the campfire or, you know, that, um, that it's, it's participatory and not hierarchical, you know what I mean? I see. Thanks. Yeah. One last question. Hi. Hi. I was wondering if you could um, specify the means by which the brain actually entrains to the to the rhythm. I was thinking that, um, to my knowledge, dogs and cats also have the ear canal structure so they could mm -hmm. hear a beat and then entrain to it but we don't see cats or dogs for instance getting into music particularly in front of the stereo or anything i've never yeah, seen yeah. that happen yeah why why would it happen to humans that's a super interesting question yeah there uh recently um there is a parrot called alex mm -hmm. that has that like bobs its head to Backstreet Boys songs, which I find disturbing. Um, 
Uh, but there's actually a sea lion uh, in San Diego who has been trained to similarly uh, bob her head um, to, to disco, which I think is much better. I would rather watch a sea lion dance to disco than a parrot dance to Backstreet Boys, but that's, that's me. Um, true, but, but they the, were paid to do that, right, with food. You're probably true. Um, the, so <coughs> it appears unique um, in, uh, in biologic, in the animal world, the human ability to discern periodicity in the audio stream um, seems unique. And so uh, one of the suggestions is that, that it has to do with our capacity for language, maybe. Part of, our, um, part of the neural resources for making music are, are shared with language making resources. Um, so there was this hypothesis that animals that, um, because this parrot and this, uh, because the parrot is a vocal learner, the parrot doesn't grow up talking. It hears its conspecifics making sounds and it imitates those sounds. And that was hypothesized to be the thing that if, if a creature can imitate sounds, then maybe it has the capacity to detect that kind of periodicity but the sea lion is not a vocal learner, so that kind of threw that hypothesis off. Um, it's, I mean, it's mysterious, you know, the, the, like what music is to the brain is, um, is strange. It's an emergent uh, thing, you know, that um, where it came from and why it's so compelling to us is, is very mysterious, and also, like, how does it work, you know? When, I, uh, when you think about, um, what's going on, musicians on stage or people dancing, you know, the, the calculations that your brain is making in order to just discern uh, a chord are very complex, you know, lightning fast. And uh, similarly with music, you know, if you, uh, you know, you go to see a DJ and the, like, the, the difference between, like, really feeling the groove of what you're hearing versus being like, meh, you know, is like microseconds, you know, this micro timing in a, in, a rhythm, in a rhythm that's repeating over and over. It's just fractions of a second. And so it's a super mysterious mechanism, um, but it's, a, it's one that I'm glad that we've got, you know what I mean? Okay. One more very short question, if anyone has. Yeah, then the last one. Um, yeah, I was wondering about um, arrhythmic music, how the brain uh, entrains to uh, rapidly shifting oscillations or rapidly shifting rhythms. What, did you say arrhythmic music? Arrhythmic, yes. That's, uh, that's an interesting question. Actually, uh, the other night I, uh, I was in this very room listening to some deeply arrhythmic music and I was thinking about like what you know, what that is, you know, especially some of your more abstract, um, you know, very ambient music, you know, uh, how, how do we, um, what, how does that manifest in the brain? What, what is, what's going on there? Especially because um, the majority of music kind of in, in human culture that we know of has, has been, um, has been rhythmic. Um, I think in that case, you know, so there, there are kind of uh, the brain processes rhythmic, uh, rhythmic material uh, through structures that are related to motor activity, the movement of your body. Things like pitch and harmony are processed through your auditory cortex. So there's a, sort of a divergence about like where that processing is happening. Um, I mean, it makes sense to me that like rhythm and motion go together would be handled by similar structures. In the case of something arrhythmic, um, I expect that that would be primarily in, uh, in the part of your brain that is traditionally associated with hearing. And um, so there are, you know, there's a whole separate system that is, is uh, tracking frequencies and their relationships to each other, harmonies. And uh, so that is what is probably very active if you're listening to music that has harmonic content but no rhythmic content. Um, but uh, that's an interesting question. Okay, thank you so much.